James, Big Daddy Roth here in Bondesh, California. And while Dutch is working on his little three-wheel side hack over here, I'm going to sort of lay down the, the thing we're trying to do here today. You guys have been writing in and asking a lot about how Dutch holds his brush and that kind of stuff and what kind of brushes he uses and all that stuff. And we're going to go over that with him today and try to find out how he started and how he got developed this thing. He's the man that started it all. And all you pinstripers out there, you might be too young to remember this, but Dutch is the guy that took that brush in his hand for the first time and when we were nosing and decking those cars and he'd start laying those lines down. So today we're going to talk to Dutch about that and see what kind of things he has to tell you about being a better pinstriper and the, the things that you can do in your own place to help you yourself make uh, great uh, strides in your own work. Because uh, you don't notice it yourself, but when you see a guy like Dutch do these things, then you can uh, judge for yourself where you do, what you're doing wrong, how you can improve your own style. Okay, gang, here we are in Dutch's uh, studio. And uh, I've had so many guys write in Dutch about these things that I want to cover some of them before we get into uh, doing anything with the brush. And, and the first thing is, tell me about that story about the first time you ever did a custom again. Well, you mean a bike? Yeah. No, the car. Yeah. Well, I just seen this guy he used to come in this car lot and he used to truck charge a buck to stripe a car. And he'd do it in about 10 minutes and he'd get a buck, so he'd do about five cars, go out with five bucks, and I said, wow, that's, you know, that's pretty neat. Yeah. He'll pick up five bucks like that, because at that time, I could say, if he could do, uh, nobody was making any money. That was a depression. Yeah. The, uh, so it was, uh, that seemed like a good, you know, beat washing dishes. Okay, what about the first, uh, you know, those little chicken scratch designs you got in the, the hood and deck in the, like in the 50s? Well, that all came from covering scratches. That came from actually covering scratches. Guys that do a nose job and a dead job, then they get in a hurry on their preparation. And they put the paint on for the prime and was good and dry, and all the scratches would come back, which happened. And I had a guy come in, and we were just outlining the wheel wells and stuff at that time. And this guy came in and he said, hey, can you do some of them scratches? So I put a line where there was a scratch, then I put a line just like it where there was no scratch, and so forth and so on, and composed this thing that was all made like that. It covered scratches made from a, from a circular grinder is all they did. And the form, the curves and everything in the form, that's all the curves of the body grinder. That's what established the whole form was the scratches being made by, by a grinder. So the guys, that copied you, fuck ups. the guys that copied you did not know what they were copying. No, they didn't know that that originated, of course, in the idea of covering up scratches. But that's what it was, uh, where it all originated. And everybody went wild. They loved it. They said, it's great. Put one of them things on mine, right? Well, they ain't even got any scratches, right? <laughs> but, I mean, that's where it all started. It all started from covering scratches. Okay, now your background is from a sign paint family, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody family. painted something. Okay, what did Always. you do as a kid? Did you, did you pick up your dad's brushes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did he show yeah. you what the... No, he wouldn't. He said, you learn, you <laughs> learn. Just keep practicing. No, he would never teach me that. Did you ever believe he'd learn? I didn't know. I just kept doing it. The, uh, but it was available. You know, the stuff was there. And the sign painting, of course, is similar. Although, uh, 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 dad never did any science at all, ever. Or, I mean, any, any striping. He says, that's a specialty. I don't do that. He's strictly a sign painter. Yeah. And uh, the uh, and they, he was a superb goalie guy. He was probably one of the best that ever lived. Yeah, I heard his and reputation from the guys. Yeah, yeah. and uh, just the goalie to him was just nothing to it. And uh, the it was fantastic. They used to farm him out from all the other shops just to do goalie. And like he did a thing down at Frank Wiggins uh, Trade School in L.A., which had the sign painting school and everything in there. Uh -huh. He painted a sign on the place, and it looks like it's carved into the brick building. And people go over and feel it all the time. Because it does. It looks like it's carved right in the building. Fantastic. Well, now, what about these guys that don't have any kind of a background for uh, sign painting and stuff? Well, how, how can they get started? I think, first of all, you got to be able to draw. You've got to have control over your hands. If you don't have control over your hands, there you are. That's it. 
I mean, you know, nowadays everybody's trying to say everyone's equal. Everybody ain't equal. Everybody's an individual. Everybody's different. Some people got a talent in one thing, some people got a talent in another. And if you can't draw or do things with your hands, forget it. You're not going to be a sign painter or a striker. Give it up. What if you have a real bad desire to be one? Well, then you might overcome it with endless, endless practice. How would you start? Well, you you've got to start out by well, what do you first, draw? well what do you draw? if you're going to get into signs, you got to get the, you got to realize that the letter, you don't invent numbers, you don't invent letters. Those letters have already been here for hundreds of years. Nobody is so precious that they make a new letter. That's what my dad always said. So use the ones that are in the book. Learn how to make them. He says, then if you want to mess around and gussy them up and make them a little do it, but learn the, how to do it right. Legit sign work first, then play with it. Most of the guys want to play with it right away. Yeah. And, they, and, and the thing with signs is that an amateur, someone who knows nothing about sign painting, can tell when there's something the matter with a sign. Everyone spots it. Yeah. Everyone can see, uh, people who are not painters see an amateur sign. They know it's an amateur sign the minute they look at it. Because they don't use the out-of-the-book lettering. They try to invent letters. Also, they all have one tendency in common, which is really wild. Beginners always make tall, skinny letters. Always. And if you only concentrate on short, squatty letters, they look more professional. Amateurs invariably will make tall, skinny letters. Every time. Without fail. And you okay, see you, it then, So then what did you start drawing when you messing around? Did you draw airplanes? Did you draw a car? What did you draw? I drew every kind of damn thing because that's all I ever did in school was draw. I didn't do anything else. I never did any of the school work at all when I was in school. All I did was draw. I sit there and draw. That's all I ever did. They didn't like it? Too bad. That's all I did was draw. Okay. And I draw the desk. I draw the wall. I draw the, the, the what was going on outside. Or I, uh, in fact, I used to like to uh, draw pictures of ink bottles. But I draw pictures of everything. And I think at one time I reached a point where maybe I had already drawn a picture of almost everything. So then I started making up stuff to draw, you know, inventing things. And then I could draw pictures of dinosaurs and, you know, and cars and, uh, and, uh, and bikes were nice, uh, you know, motorcycles because they've got all their mechanism out in the open. You know, they're all covered up with a bunch of tin. Yeah. And you can see everything from a bike. That's, that's why bikes are fared in, never, never sell, they never have. Every time they try it, it's a failure. Or air, cars that look like airplanes never sell, never. Yeah. We've got a whole history of cars that came out and looked like airplanes and never sold. Companies went out of business like Studebaker and everybody else that made a car look like an airplane. So when somebody uh, suggests a sign job to you, you've already got a picture of it in your head. Oh, yeah. 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 So then and I use a legit letter at most of the time, except for, you know, the ones that, that you've not noticed that, that I changed for the sake of speed or whatever. Yeah. But you got you got to know the legit letter first. Then you can play with it. And, uh, the, uh, and there's books full. Yeah, I... I and my, my dad said that. Nobody is so precious that they invent a letter. I agree with that. I, these guys work for... Hundreds of years to develop that Roman alphabet. And yeah, and all of a sudden this upstart's going to come along and change all that. Yeah. Well, with lettering, you're not covering up scratches. This <laughs> is so the. Uh, it's a different so, thing. So to start with the sign, you've already got a picture of it in your head, right? Yeah, I see the whole thing right there. Boom. Okay. That's why, if you notice, I never make layouts hardly ever. You use guidelines? I, I know sometimes I don't do that either. Don't use guidelines. No, I use tape a lot now. That's more convenient. Because a lot of times you have to figure out how to get the guideline off after you're done. The tape works better. I just put some tape there. You just stay close to it. I think what I'd like to do is uh, have you start out with the sign that, uh, and show you know how the palette works. and Yeah. It's, it's all our the palette. discussion of the palette. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it, uh, it's, it's not as critical on the palette and signs as it is in striping. Striping is all on the palette. That's where it's at. And it's only practice. There's no way that you can transmit this information to somebody else. You couldn't do it. Because there's no dials to turn or anything and say you put two thousandths of this or five thousandths of that or so many gram. This is not, there's no information that you can transmit other than what we'll do. Yeah. And then from there, 
Uh, it's, it's just up to practice, 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 practice. There's another thing too, especially the striping, which I think is more so than the same thing. When you're practicing striping, and if you're really into it, if it is not the most important thing in the world to you, you ain't gonna do it. Okay, that's gonna... It's got to become an yeah. obsession. It's got to become the most important thing to be able to make an absolutely perfect straight line like a machine made it. Okay. You've got to imitate a machine, and you've got to put your head into that, and it's very much like yoga. In fact, if you, you get deep into, into striping, you can actually go away and meditate while your body is striping. And the, so there's uh, no room for drugs or... No room at all. They don't work. They don't do anything. Okay. Okay. Good or bad. I mean, but bad because you, you wander off in your thinking. The, uh, no. Uh -huh. No room for drugs of any kind. No. Okay. Uh -huh. It don't work. Just have nothing but a bad effect. Never a good one. How about the guys that fool themselves and thinking they can smoke a joint or something and do some good work? They want to come back later and look at it. <laughs> that's a big difference. I think that's the difference between drugs and booze. I think that's what the big difference is. Most of guys, when they're drunk, think up a bunch of things, and the next morning they wake up and say, God, that was a dumb idea. But most of the dopers still think it was a good one. <laughs> and it was dumb. <laughs> right? Yeah, but next day they look at it and they still think it's good. What about the palate? I notice you use a phone book all the time. Do you use that all the time? No, I used to use anything but handy, but when I was doing an awful lot of the work, I needed lots of pallets, so that was just a convenience to use that. And there was something uh, common to find, the phone book. Plenty of them around. And little square buildings they got in there. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of pallet are you going to use today? Well, I know we just use a piece of this cardboard. Probably just use this to look good as anything. Okay. The, uh, and we'll get into the, into where it all begins. In fact, as the striping is concerned, more so. See, I notice you don't pallet a whole lot. No. Yeah. But see, to me, that's that's where it's all at. But I'm not a good striper. I'm a speed striper. Yeah. I go to the agencies. You do good work. That's why I can't show them how I do it because uh, it's not the right way. Well, I'm not sure whether mine's the right way either, because although it works, but I mean, see, when I first started striping, uh, I had no one to learn it. I didn't even know what kind of brush to use. In fact, what happened was I, I seen the work on things. I said, some guy took a, a brush and he made a line on there. Now, how'd he do that? So I got a quill, and I fought with a quill for years. You did the chisel edge of a quill? I used a small quill for striping. Oh, boy. I, I didn't know any better. And finally, I found out there was a special brush for that. And when when I got that special brush, I mean, it was it was so easy with that, by having the right one. But I had no idea. I also didn't know what kind of paint anybody used. So I figured if you're doing cars, you use car paint, right? So I used a regular lacquer like you paint cars with. And I fought that and fought that for years and years and got to where I was doing them until I ultimately ran into another striper and we were we, we were talking about what we were using, and he says, lacquer? He says, how can you possibly use lacquer? And I said, don't everybody? I don't know no different. He says, it's impossible to do that in lacquer. So I said, well, what do you use? And he showed me the, uh, the enamel that he was using, which, which happened to be at that time the one shot, which all they made was white. They didn't make any color. Right, I remember that. And it was so easy to do it with that compared to the lacquer that I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. How, about the, how about that quill brush? You got pretty proficient at striping with the quill brush yeah, before I you went to the striping brush. I got brush. by with it. And then yeah. when you finally got a striping brush, it just yeah. became real easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got by with a quill. I mean, I remember one of the f first few jobs I did for that same car lot. They didn't like. Oh, I was that terrible. Looks like the waves are in it. The. Uh, but, Let's uh, talk about thinners for a minute uh, and different striping weather. Do you use the same thinners when it's hot, when it's cold? No, no, you got to adjust to that. The, uh, uh, like right now, it's almost a little too cold for comfort, but it'd be perfect for striping. Because you don't want a lot of clothes on you when you're striping easy. It gets, gets in your way. But in real hot weather, of course, it wants to dry too fast. So on the one shot, I just use a little teeny bit of oil in it or kerosene into it, to slow it down. But if you want to over-train on it, it'll never dry. You say oil, you mean, a motor oil. 
motor oil. Well, even normal old motor oil still comes out of the same hole in the ground. Okay. The uh, kerosene uh, works fine, but out here nowadays, if you say kerosene and they go, what's that? They don't know what kerosene is anymore. How about diesel oil? That probably works too. Yeah. yeah, same hole in the ground.